DC, we're going to say something? No, I'll, I'll just wait. Good, okay. Gentlemen, good to see you all. Um, I always like to start off with, now these days, any kind of announcements. So they've got a couple. Uh, with regard to the hotel in October, we pretty much got it locked in. Um, they're going to give us a group rate. We have nine already coming, not including Charlie and his nephew, Will. So we got we got one more bed that would give us the meeting room at a discount. Um, and of course, the dates have been moved up one day. We're doing a Wednesday afternoon check-in versus Thursday. Because Thursday, this guy, Lee Millar, who's taken us on tours in the past to Vicksburg and Shiloh, he's taken us to Donaldson and Henry. So Thursday will be a day of uh, uh, a road trip. And then Friday, we're going to just play over at the, the ONA layout in there. That's Charlie and his former friend. Anyhow, so that's with the hotel and the trip. Uh, another couple of folks I heard from, not from you guys, I don't think. Uh, that when they go to the YouTubes and they're trying to find something, they ask me if there's a way I can organize it so they don't have to go through and read each one. So I created about six or seven playlists that have them in categories. So if you happen to go through there and look, let me know if it makes a difference or not, just so I know, you know, maybe I need to tweak it. Uh, playlists. And uh, two more things. Uh, I came across this, you might have heard of him, John, Professor Dr. Christopher Gable. Uh, he worked at some army facility, a, a professor, and he wrote a book called Rails to Oblivion about Confederate railroads during the Civil War. I never oh. heard of it. And I Googled it, the book isn't in print, but it is, you can get it with an E, you know, it's as an e-book. But I saw him on a video on C-SPAN, I highly recommend it. A lot of this stuff you guys will know, but his delivery is fun. And he says a couple of things that I thought could be interesting conversation, if not controversial with our group. I was like, wow, you said, okay. I'd like to hear what John Ott's got to say about that. Or uh, it was like, and, yeah, but anyway, so the short of it is he's retired. And I sent him a note through his Facebook page because I'm hoping he'd be willing to come to our meet in October and be a speaker. Yeah, he's great. He's great. And he knows a lot of stuff. So anyway, that's that. And then lastly, if anybody's interested, I found <laughs> I found three Troiani prints I forgot I had. And uh, so those are going up for sale. That's all my announcements. Anybody have anything you want to share as an announcement? I don't know if my sound's working, Tom, but uh, do you have the name again of the book? Yes. Christopher Gable. I'll put it in the chat. Thank uh, you. Yep, I will do that. Cool. Let me get this out of the way. I'll do that uh, before we end tonight, Al. Thank you. Yep. All right. So is this the one? Let's see. Oh, I've got Mr. Gable on as a, as a video to share. Okay. There we go. Busy bell, yes. Oh, wow. Everybody can see that? Yep. Yes. Okay. The only reason I'm showing this is it's, you know, Bernie did me a nice favor and changed it according to more how it looks. There's a couple of things we have to, I have to help him alter. But the, the key things being this section here has been cut away and then that the layout is already against the wall here. So we extended it here, as some of you, if not all of you know. Um, and it also shows the cutout here. And just as, just to give you a, a refresher of the layouts, and when I start talking about the obsession, you got some reference points. And I'll hit this map a couple of times as we go. Um, so this was a design obsession. I was thinking, um, what can I glean from certain sources? And these were pri primarily the sources. I've got a lot of notes on all kinds of train configurations from primarily these sources. And then one I was focusing on for the most recent obsession was an artillery train special, a freight run, and a passenger run as a return. So that was my head going into this. And typically, 
I've got three to four crews, you know, like seven guys and um, or eight guys. And then in this recent one, I was wanting to do something where it gave everybody room to just run it without any way bills, et cetera. So however long it took, it took just a note when a train arrived to depart it, just make a note on your uh, on the clipboard I gave, gave each guy so I can calculate what's the real timing on this stuff. So four operators showed up and we did something new this time. We did a yard master. And uh, his job was to build a freight consist. I gave him 15, blah, blah. And then as soon as that train left, he was going to build a passenger train. So the freight consist, there, there was a freight consist from Chattanooga to Atlanta, one engineer. I was giving him like a minute and fit like that. And then there was another special coming out of Atlanta, or actually just a special that had one engineer. That was DC. Then we had an artillery train coming out of Kingston with a wide turnaround. And there was only one engineer for that. So usually operating in crews, I was on one level, I'm thinking, is it faster with one crew member? And evidently it wasn't, but we worked it out. So again, the yard master, can, is the cursor nice and big? Yes. Or is it it yeah. is, cool. I can see it. Great. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know about anyone on a phone, but I can see it. Yeah, all right. Thank you, Eddie. So Chattanooga, whoops, Chattanooga had the yard master and an engineer waiting while he did that. And the engineer's loco was on the turntable. So he had to move some cars from these tracks over to here and build the train for this guy to pick up and go. When that left, there were some passenger cars the yard master was going to need to hook up and get it ready for the train that comes in after that one that left. DC started in Atlanta with his special, stopping at all the fuel and water stations along the way, which I think there's like three or four. And then we had the guy in Kingston. He had a locomotive over here on this track and needed to do a wide turnaround to pick up some artillery train. And then head over to Chattanooga along with Atlanta at some point. <laughs> so the realizations, the Atlanta special arrived in 23 minutes, which not, is not necessarily a bad thing, but the yard master was still building the first train. So the special was required to wait. And of course the artillery train got backed up and that was held in Dalton. And then a freight consist departed 20 minutes later than planned. So the guy that brought in the artillery train was supposed to pick up um, another train, but that couldn't even go because the first train couldn't even get out of Chattanooga and these other trains are already in. I guess you could say it's kind of prototypical given the war. So the introduction of waybills and timetables will certainly add to the, uh, the operations time. And the bottom line was it really gave me, and I think the operators too, some uh, realizations around how to plan and schedule these um, op sessions. And then the special was unexpected by the yard master. And I thought, you know what? This would be a good time to pause. So think about that. The special ended up in Chattanooga and the yard master was like, what are you doing here? So my rationale for that was uh, telegraph, knowing the WNA didn't, this is, this is the, the neophyte in me. Uh, there would be no telegraph in Chattanooga because, you know, there were lines down or something. Um, and when DC got, we had an interesting conversation around that yard master would have known somebody. What were you saying, DC, would at least got on a wagon? Or well, a there, there could have, um, uh, there were, the theory, the theory was there would have been more trains actually running than we had going during that particular session. And that if the train was starting out from some place without telegraph access, you know, they would have they would have sent a message ahead to the yard master with an earlier train coming in. That would make sense. Right. I get the, the bottom line question for me, is there any plausibility to the fact that a yard would not know that a train was coming? Anybody know that? in that era. I'll go back to the incidents of the Great Chase. Uh, you know, when 
when the unexpected train showed up, the people in the telegraph offices tended to shrug and let him go by. It didn't seem to be that big of a deal. Nobody was out there with a red flag saying, no, you can't go. Interesting. And that was that happened at Kingston uh, on the real one. On the real one. Mm -hmm. That's right, because there were those three, there's two other trains that were. Yeah, yeah they're, they're the trains blocking the yard. Right. Now, there, there would not have been, there were not uh, telegraphers at every depot or stop. Right. However, I would, you know, despite what you said, Tom, I think there would have been every effort to make to keep the telegraph lines open between Chattanooga and Atlanta. Those were major hubs. Right. Well, I get how we're going to play it when we work on your layout. I get it. <laughs> That's very clear. That's great. That's great. So uh, we were talking earlier, too, about terminology. And the question that popped up to me today, because I was as I was writing up the these slides, I wrote the word consist. And it's, I stopped. I said, wait a minute. Was that a term that was even used back in the 1860s and 50s? Or did it come later? Sounds like a later term to me. So it would. So. And they would just refer to it as a train or the train. You have the passenger train, you have whatever train, you have the, it would not be the constant. Ah, interesting. Cool. Okay. I'll eliminate And, and a train could be made up of different sections. You know, section A was pulled by an engine, section B pulled by an engine. Mm -hmm. Right. Consist was later. Okay. That's good. I think there's something else here for you. Hang on a second. That, that, that brings me to the what, what you and I were talking about, Tom, that with the uh, use of um, DCC control, yeah. Yeah. you could run a train consisting of two or more sections yes. controlled by one, in, one uh, throttle. Yeah, as you so, say that, I, I did that the other night. Actually, I put, oh. I put three together with 10 cars each, and they're all, I backed them up all the way from Dalton to see how they go through. Let me just pull this up for you guys so you know what the hell we're talking about. Uh, so uh, this, is a, this is the toughest curve for most trains. And this one over here by Chattanooga can be a little difficult. But I, I built three trains of 10 cars each with the locomotives I, that I thought could pull. One's got 11. And I backed them all the way around and all three of them made it around backing up. So I've got them all sitting down here in, in uh, Big Shanty. And I'm, I'm gonna run two and see how that plays out. But I thought, man, that, that could be fun for somebody running just two trains, convoy kind of thing. Anyhow. Okay, we did that, we did that. Oh yeah, the consist. Oh yeah. Let me see what else I got, okay. So, was the braking responsible for returning the switch to the main? And the other question actually, I should ask before that, was it required to keep the, uh, the switch on the main? So that was the responsibility of a train or you just go through, throw the switch and you just keep going? back then? As far as I know, it was the responsibility of the train crew. Ah, uh, okay. And but, but remember the, from... I was gonna say, was the requirement that they leave it on the main if they if they switched it? Uh, it? They were responsible for setting it however way the general instructions of the line told them to. Uh, that was decided ahead of time. This switch is always going to be set this way oh excellent and uh, that was part of the rules of the road which everybody needed to know whether they memorized it i and i think they mostly memorized it they yeah didn't, they didn't have it written down anywhere okay. now if i remember accurately from the great locomotive chase the um wasn't there a 
I can't remember, station agent, whoever in Kingston, wasn't there a big kerfuffle over uh, Andrew's throwing a switch so his train could depart yeah. or something? Yeah, the switchman was giving him a hard time about it. Yeah. I wonder, where were they, were they locked back then? I know in my youth that a lot of times they, they were locked no. because there was too easy for some of the uh, younger members of the immediate environment to go playing with things. Predetermined. From all the accidents, I'd say no. That, 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 was, that was too smart for back then. <laughs> but you know, I don't know. Every every railroad had a different design of uh, of, of uh, switch gear, so you know it's it's conceivable mm -hmm. some of them had locks. But you know, I tend to doubt it. That just yeah, makes you to carry along the keys. Yeah, yeah. People weren't that deviant back then, like on that level. <laughs> you know, I saw an interesting. Uh, History, there was a big wreck in Pennsylvania, but we're, this is more like early 1900s. But there was this one uh, freight train that would always, at this one point, it had train orders to go on a siding, and he had to wait until a passenger train came the other way, and then after the passenger, he get to go ahead to go. This happened virtually every day. And then one day, they got a news, something had happened. The early milk train had not gone. When this guy's on the siding, Okay, you got to wait for two trains. There's a passenger train and there's a milk train that'll come before. He gave the guy the slip, the the the, the guy at the station where he was, gave him the, the engineer or the conductor, I guess engineer, the slip say, okay, wait for two trains to pass. It had always been one. He didn't read it. He just sort of put it in his pocket, didn't even look at it. So as soon as the one train went by, he, he flipped the switches, put the train on the main. And when the guy at the station saw it, he read it when it was coming in. He had no way to contact it. So he immediately, he was able to telegraph hospitals and so on, like, get ready, there's going to be a big wreck. And sure enough, he head ended, you know, a wreck with the with the passenger train, that they were already on, the, he knew where they would meet by their speeds right. and everything. And so then they took care of it. So I believe that railroad changed the rule to when you get orders, you have to read them out loud. Because, you know, how many years had be gone and you didn't ever have to read it. Right. So anyway, just some of these right. subjects if that was in the 1900s god knows what was in the earlier time <laughs> i i would also think uh the switch gear you know because a lot there you're moving stub switches that are a little bit harder to uh uh switch uh so maybe they didn't need uh they didn't need to have locks on them because it required a lot of effort to change them my opinion yeah. yeah interesting yeah so uh uh let's see where was i oh yeah and oh i am you know what just for grins let me show you these last two slides i was thinking oh, i tell you my mind's been going ever since that last obsession i even thought of uh doing something because i watch guys struggle with how they uh, attempt to um, couple the cars. <laughs> and I, I, you know what? Here's a photo. And uh, I think, what do you think, DC? Should I present that at the next session somehow? Yeah, that might be useful. Well, if you have newbies, some of us who you know, have operated it on it for a while kind of know about touching cars and what needs to be done they probably got their own techniques too I mean, you know what that's, that's what i'm going to watch for next time i'm going to watch to see how they do that completely yeah it's been a lot of fun i tell you um yep in june what is it june uh 17th we're going to do this might be the last one until uh the fall so this should be a this should be a good time got about six seven guys coming perfect um any questions or anybody converse about ops at all any insights now with uh the different sections um uh, my assumption is that they used flags 
or was that a uh, yeah? Not yet? Yeah, you're correct. Flags. They would put flags on the train to let them know there's one coming behind, coming after them. All right. So, so you would have like green flags for the ones in the front, and then the last tr uh, train would have uh, white. Or was that uh, not the turn? Uh, was that not solidified into a single uh, thing yet? Where different railroads would have different flags, I guess. That's a John Ott or somebody else question. For, I don't know. I do not remember the colors. I all I ever heard of was a red flag, right, John? Yeah, that was pretty universal. But yeah, he, he, you're you're right. Every railroad had their own variation on it. Yeah, and there there wasn't any anything close to standardization until years after the war. Right. Yeah, that the war accelerated the educational curve <laughs> on what works. Yes. Well, a, a lot of people who would go on to uh, work in the uh, railroad industry, they got their training there, you know, with U.S. military railroads and right. railroads in general in yeah. the Civil War. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gosh. Uh, a few meetings ago, we talked about different um, surprise, surprise things coming in, like all of a sudden there's some cows on the track, stuff like that. Have you had a chance to do any of those kind of things yet? Or Oh, interesting that you say that, my friend. Um, there's a few, again, from, from those sources I shared earlier, there's, there's a few more that I came up with. Where the heck did they go? Um, oh, here we go. Let's see. You know, it just occurred to me if it'd be allowed, what if there was a skirmish and she got some wounded waiting, hoping to get picked up and, and taken to somewhere? Ah, uh, you know what? I'm just going to end that right now. That's very good. That's very good. You just see a bunch of guys laying by the side of the road that are all shot up. Yep. And so I that wrote. Will affect your time. Right. So, so mm -hmm. for DC's benefit, my first one is telegraph has been cut. The station above <laughs> you does not know you're coming. <laughs> that was brilliant. Uh, thank you, DC. Uh, <laughs> and then another one is to meet, uh, and you put the operator's name in, at like Kingston to hand off a bucket of something or other. I was reading in, oh man, it might have been in Angle's book, Craig Angle. They talked about how one engineer was requesting a bucket of something from another one. Yeah. So I thought, okay, no, <laughs> not quite new. No. I was thinking maybe whatever they would pack the journals, maybe he needed that. Um, the third one is uh, your engineer is too intoxicated to continue. Return to the previous stop and await a replacement. I like that one. I like that one a lot. So anyway, yeah, it's like I, I, I'm out. That, that could be be based on operator real time one to one scale experience on the layout. If they run through a a turnout that's uh, thrown the wrong direction and they have a derailment or something. Uh, yeah, you yeah. had we're cutting you off today, Tom. Okay. <laughs> You go sit in the corner, put someone else on this train. <laughs> <laughs> or right. DC as the case may be. Right. Well, the way it's going to work is, let's say you're the conductor and I am the engineer. You have the slip that says you're engineer and you've got to tell me that I've got to back up into the town. That's all. So, yeah, we'll we'll see. We'll see. It's too bad you're not coming on the 17th. I put us on the same. No, I can't. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Did you um, figure out uh, what was the holdup with making up the trains? Yeah. Um, it took the yard master almost 40 minutes to build the consist that I had set up. And it was actually connecting. You had to pull two cars from one track. And the freight had four. And there, so he had to pick up eight all together, but I guess it just took a while. And then, then I realized, Jesus, this is somebody that is 
really done a lot of op sessions other places and it kept on shorting on the layout and i still don't have the circuit breakers in yet and it turned out that he was short in his own train he didn't realize he was further into the switch than he needed to be um that was part but that wasn't the it wasn't a big delay it just took a while and then by the time the engineer moved his locomotive off to turn it's interesting how long it takes and it's not like these guys are like running we're trying to run them at a prototypical speed um it just took 40 minutes and dc was there in less than half the time or more, a little more than half the time that was so and, and i was using water stops at, at first i tried to uh stop for a full minute at a uh, station you know 30 seconds to get water 30 seconds to get wood but that was too conducive to me beginning to talk to someone else you know and which so because because 30 seconds doesn't seem like a long time, but it is when you're actually running the trains. Right, right, right. Plus, I, I think it was uh, Dan who figured out that, you know, 15 seconds equivalent was equivalent if you were scaling time to a couple hours. 15 seconds, oh, it can't be. 15 seconds to two hours? It, it was, I can't remember that. I wish she was here to talk. You go through a day in like two minutes less that's a, yeah anyway that's an interesting one did anybody ever run um what do you call it um scale clock or whatever that is yes how does how, oh andy so what what's the scale minutes for hl i when i operate at tom piccarello's house where i normally am on thursday nights tom right. is over in italy tonight uh we do uh four to one okay so okay. for every uh you get four minutes on the on this on the clock for every minute uh, that actually is taking place so gotcha 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 yeah so when you when you do a station stop you do a two minute station stop on the fast clock it's 30 seconds interesting okay so, hmm. and, and, uh, Occasionally, we run a scheduled passenger train in among the, the freights. Right, right, so right, right. You have to be out of the way of the freight train uh, within five minutes on the fast clock, which is a minute and a half on this on layout. real time. Okay. Yeah. And you just get out, you know, if you just get off the main line, if, you know, you, if you work in the town, you, you hang into the siding and you stay there until the passenger comes through. Right. So, okay. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many guys here are familiar with Tom's layout. That's a, it's it's a traction layout. Uh, it's based in New Jersey, but it's kind of based on the the interurban lines that were out in Indiana and Illinois. But all the locations on his layout are Jersey locations, mm. and the the passenger train is usually just one car. Wow. So, hmm. oak scale too. Yeah, that that's a joy. I'm looking forward to seeing Charlie's again after all the work he's done on his. Tom, are your locos all wood burning? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Was coal, I thought coal was in by like sixty five or you know at the very end. I think they did coal in the north before the south. John. Well, Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was beginning to use coal, but most most engines were still wood burners. It, it, it depended on the railroad and if they had access to coal. Uh, it wasn't any. It wasn't a north-south thing. Mm. Now, did you have to upgrade the whole locomotive? I mean, are you, are you running under more pressure, anything like that, if you're going to convert from wood to coal? I think the biggest change would have been in the grate. I, believe, I recall reading that somewhere that they could change. They could change from the wood to coal, but the grate had to be. I, I think it had that smaller grate so that the coal wouldn't uh, fall through it. Mm. And you could uh, still shake the ash out. It also depended on the type of coal you were trying to burn. <laughs> yeah. If you were trying to burn hard coal in a narrow firebox that was designed for wood, just it just didn't work very well. So, 
I think I could be wrong, but I think they also had to add a uh, masonry arch in it, so the there would be a longer path of uh, uh, for the heat to go through. Yeah, you had to have a brick, a fire brick arch inside the firebox. So that, that was pretty standard. That was that was a New England uh, innovation. We for, they're the ones that first had them. I think they did that with wood burners also. In order, in order to give it more time to to, to, to burn and heat the uh, heat the uh, the flame up before it went through the tubes. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm trying. I'm trying to think of which one it is, but it's one of the one of the earlier. Uh, I almost want to say it might have been the Dewalt Clinton was uh, one of the early locomotives was actually designed to burn coal, but they haven't figured out how to design uh, the. They haven't figured out how to build a coal locomotive boiler. So it, was, it wound up being converted back into wood because they couldn't get run. They couldn't get it to run on coal properly. But I forgot which. I I think it was. I think it was. It might have been a Dewalt Clinton on the uh, Alb Albany and Schenectady, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly. There were a lot of experiments. A lot, they they tried to burn coal practically from the very beginning. Hmm. But again, it's founded on a type of coal they were trying to burn, and how available it was, and how successful they were in designing a firebox that would actually uh, burn the stuff and give heat. What did conveyors come in anywhere in the eighteen hundreds, or however they did the more automatic? Okay. Uh oh. No. Nope. Everything I think was by shovel at that point. Mm -hmm. Labor was cheap. <laughs> well, the, the, the camel engines on the B&O yeah. um, were designed with fireboxes that were so long that the uh, firemen who had to stand on the tender in order to fire the locomotive, uh, he couldn't reach the front of the firebox. So they actually had a chute on the top of the fireboxes uh, and a two-level tender. Mm -hmm. The fireman actually had to shovel the coal first onto that second level, then right. get up and then feed the uh, coal into the chute to get to the front of the firebox. That would be the winners, uh, the winners engines. Yep, winings, 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 cross winings, camels. Yeah. Those were on the long boiler, the long boiler camels. There was three different kinds of camels: short boiler, medium boiler, and long boiler. It just seems it would have been. Sorry, John. And the firebox hung out tremendously long distance off the back. Yeah. It was... Wasn't it a hot ride for that engineer? Uh, no. I know. Nobody knows these days. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody bothered to write much about it. <clears throat> Well, well, you know, with the photos of the camels, you hardly ever see the windows closed. So that's kind of a clue. Yeah. Windows were open. And Wyans didn't bother with Wyans didn't bother with lagging on the boilers either. So so yeah, it was a pretty hot ride up there. Yeah. When I was in college, I uh with the Trenton State the Teachers College in New Jersey, and of course, it was the New Hope in Ivy Land. And uh, I'd go over there on Saturdays when they started running in the spring and, in, and early in the fall. And I got to be so well known showing up there just to watch the trains. I got invited into the cab a few times, and it was hot. It was hot. I mean, you're just standing there and you start sweating. There was a lot of heat coming off the back of that boiler. You know, and a camelback sitting up on top of it. It was a fact of life, and that's how they did their job. Have any of you read uh, Bell's book, uh, Southern Railroad Man? Decades ago. Oh, that's a great one. 
That's a great one. And a couple of summers ago. You did, yeah, yeah. You know, in, in its own little, well, I don't go that far. Um, there's another one called Train Running for the Confederacy. Anybody ever read that one or see that one? That It's mostly, um, I think it's Virginia Central. But, you know, again, just it's personal accounts and stories of their experience during the war. It's remarkable that these are, you know, and of course, all of Kurtz's stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny how you just like go into a zone with it's fascinating. I don't know. I, don't, I should probably see a shrink. <laughs> <laughs> I think no, everyone, here should, everyone here should. <laughs> it's like. I'll find one that works specifically with obsessive model railroaders. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I and I, I, I've been, uh, they, they, I, I was made a life member in the New York Society last year because I had my 50 years in with them. And over those 50 years, I can tell you, there were at least three guys that I know of who wound up getting divorced because of the hobby. Really? Yep. Maybe you that's what she's talking about. I got to pay attention to what she's telling me more specifically. Yeah. There's kind of a like a comedy short. I think it's on like five minutes done. It looks like back in the late 50s, early 60s where a guy got utterly obsessed with the train and like it goes around and serves part of dinner and stuff like that. It's a fun, he actually goes to a dog, he goes to a shrink and the yes. shrink starts asking about his railroad. Then he shows the stuff he has, his, his train equipment. Yes, <laughs> I know. I, it goes all throughout his house. Yeah, it's a, that's, a, that's a crazy video. It is. That's really good. I know. That's a good one. I just recently saw a video where is uh oh they actually have it set up where model trains actually deliver your food to where the place is. I for I want to say Vienna or someplace like that. But uh, there's a restaurant Little Rock that does that. Mm. Crazy. Now with the trains only being around 10 cars did they have mixed trains at this period or was that a layer of development as trains got longer oh no during the war man they were running like 20 23 cars mm -hmm. all right yeah mm -hmm. and in in, in uh, uh what is it train running for confederacy the guy talks about how they double-headed engines like whoa that got me going yeah thanks to george and during the andrews raid, they had three box cars and two passenger cars that, right. Isn't that correct? Yep. Uh, that was, that was 1862. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Now, the box cars came first, and then the passenger cars. All right. Now, would the now would that be considered a passenger train or a freight train? Because it doesn't seem that they designated uh, a mixed train. Oh, I think they were called mixed trains back then. Mixed freights. Mixed freights? All right. Yeah. John or Bill can counter me on that one if you want. Um, oh, did I talk about lever cars before? No? Nope. So I found out what a lever car is. And evidently they had them. This is in, is this Bell's book? It might be in Bell's book. Yes. Um, you know, the lever car, from what I understand, was the pump car. And I thought, wow, where I so I have to go back and look at that again. And it was they actually used it if somehow passengers needed to get to a train, but they couldn't wait for the train that was coming in order to get to the next station for them to make the train. Does that make sense? So they would put them on a lever car and get them to the station. And I'm thinking, wow. Um, okay, it just started my mind trying to imagine what that could look like with passengers and how they're dressed and whatnot. And they're sitting on a platform and just going, I thought, interesting. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but I thought, let me bring that up to the group and see what that percolates. Shock and awe, right? 
<laughs> well, the funny thing is, is that if they're trying to catch up with the train, does that mean the passengers have to help also help provide the local? No, they weren't trying to catch up to the train. They were trying to get to a station where they were going to catch a train. Oh, gotcha. Right. Versus wait at the station that they were at for a train that was going to be late to get them to that station. Yeah. Yeah. So yep. a, a lever call, would that be the ones that like hand pumped? That, you know, I thought he described that. But yes, but I didn't think they were in existence in 1860s. They weren't, right, John? I have to read that again. Yeah, yeah. That's what, that was my understanding. That's my understanding, too. That's a later invention. Well, what I promised I'll do, uh, let me grab it now. At the very least, next time we meet, I'll, I'll pull up that section in the book and I'll read it. One thing you're making me think of, too, is I've seen on uh, narrow gauge lines for like forestry and so on, they'll have water cars for, for fire. Oh, I've yeah. seen pictures from like 1840s where there'd be fires from cinders coming out of the locos, but I don't think I've ever seen a water car on a regular, if, I think if there's a fire, it's just too bad to see what, whatever it burns. But would they have ever had water cars for fire service on a main line? I guess some railroads, no? Yeah. I, don't, I never heard of it, but. Okay. I remember hearing somewhere where they're, they were talking about uh, trees for, for your layouts. And uh, I, th I think it was on NMR, NMRA X. And uh, he, uh, the guy, the one that was present, uh, doing the presentations uh, basically says, whatever, you know, you're, er everyone at a certain time period always puts too many trees in because there was a lot less uh, forests because everything was deforested because, well, they used wood for, you know, building materials, you know, uh, fuel and et cetera and all that. So there might not have been, uh, there might not have been enough trees around to, okay, a tree, one tree is on fire and all that, but there's no forest to, to uh, have a ma major uh, fire. That's my, uh, that's what I'm assuming. I, John, it, even back in the 1860s, it was, it was a practice where they, I, what the railroad was, was responsible for clearing a certain brush out of the way, or was that the, who was responsible for that? I would think the railroad for huh. clearing the right of way. And I think they did that back then, from what I recall reading. Uh, My understanding is they did not have fire trains until about 19, well, early 1900s. And that was mostly on the logging railroads. I, I just watched a video, and maybe it was earlier today or yesterday, uh, on the Durango and Silverton. <laughs> and uh, it's it's an old movie from the 70s. Yeah. So it's, uh, and we see train goes by and a little while later, you have a speeder going by behind them, ah. checking for fires. Yep. They still do that today. They have one in front that's a pilot <laughs> that watches the, the right of way for obstructions or anything like that. And then they have another one following behind for fires and also following to make sure that the uh, right of way stays clear. That makes sense. Yeah. I was thinking though, Again, back in the 60s. Um, I don't see, I've not come across any reference to anything. I mean, I, it may it seems like a logical practice, but I've seen no records about it. I'm almost positive I read something in one of these books where they said something about that. But I'm mm -hmm. thinking also there was probably some, well, maybe not. I was thinking there's some fields or wooded areas where they might be within, you know, a certain distance from the track that today wouldn't even be thinkable, um, just due to the fact that there was so much land to cover and only so much to do. And I, get, I don't know if they weigh the risks and it's like, this is good enough. It seems like everything was pretty much as needed, you know. Um, 
I don't know. It's just a thought. If you're thinking about populating your railroad with trees, maybe in some sections it might be plausible. <laughs> like Manassas, I think was clear cut. Mm -hmm. I think there was, you know, maybe some trees on the fringes. Uh, think back on all those photographs. A lot of them seem like the land's pretty bare. Yep. Yep. I think just change the subject just a little bit. I think you're going to find this interesting. It's in the Civil War period. I in the, I haven't finished it yet. In the course of reading uh, history of the Lehigh and Susquehanna, the canal, and then lay the railroad, which was taken over by the Jersey Central. And what I want to point out, and I, I ran across this reading it, in 1865, the Lehigh Valley Railroad out of the Wyoming Valley pulled 452,000 tons of coal out of the Wyoming Valley. The normal car that the coal rode in was a four wheel jimmy that would only handle five tons. Wow. Can you imagine how many cars they? It's, it's like, I just I figured I I couldn't I, I still find it hard to get my mind around it. How many how many cars and the average train was 50, uh, 50 cars at these cold jimmies. So they were probably double heading on that. Probably, yeah. 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 But that's a lot of that's a lot of coal. <laughs> yeah. To be more be a cool jimmy train. Yeah, she's got a bunch of things. She could do that. But I, I found I, I, I only came across that about uh, three nights ago, reading, and I said, and it just flashed, flashed into my mind. I thought I'd bring it up. It's an unusual, yeah. unbelievable statistic. Yeah. What, what I like about those, and I'm all, you know, it's funny. I'm so like thinking ops. Anything that gets into my head starts to get translated. How can I include that in an operations session? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, if I had as many Jimmies as uh, DC has, I'd probably try to rig that one up. That would be a fun train. It's just too much fun. I would do this every other week if I was divorced. <laughs> <laughs> if you did it every other or week, if, I wanted to if you did it every other week, you might be getting divorced. That's right. <laughs> right. Some and now, if any of you are witnesses, you say, "Well, he premeditated it." It's, it just, yeah. it just I came very close to a divorce this week because I wanted to go out to Pennsylvania to the uh, Rough and Tumble Museum out there. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with it. They it's all it's all steam machinery, and oh, okay. yeah. they're having a steam up this weekend. And my wife decides, you know, Sunday is the christening of our one of our our grandson. Our most recent grandson, she said, and you want to go out there when there might be something, someone they might we might need you to pick up something or do something. And <laughs> okay, hon, I'll be around. Just as an FYI, guys, <laughs> excuse me, I believe Sunday's Mother's Day. It is. Oh, don't forget, <laughs> it's Mother's Day. But the just you wow. been forewarned. Uh, the church does the christenings on the second Sunday of the month, and that's what oh it's. Oh my! Yes, yes. Oh. That's a good one. Good yeah. one, Andy. So I got the. Uh, I'll be going out in August when they have the. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that's a I good move. Take a friend out in August. Good husband. Good husband. Sounds like a good tactical uh, move, move there. Indeed. Anyway, uh, you might find it very interesting. Look, look that up. It's the Rough and Tumble Museum in uh, Kasler, Pennsylvania. It's right, yeah, it's right couple, near Strasburg. A couple of uh, my club members go there. Yeah, once it in is. a while, and they love it. Like it Jimmy is Jack unbelievable. Stadium. I've been there once about six years ago, and anyway, it's impressive. It's an impressive place. See, so, um, what I would do is I would bring the grandson to the uh, the the rough and tumble and all that and because you know that you're oh. going to be baptized baptized with steam you know this, yeah. this my, my, is, you know not directly on the, the nozzle <laughs> dense and then you know drip on them my oh, old okay. my older grandson my oldest grand, uh, grandchild is 10 years old uh he's andrew the fourth 
And Andrew the Fourth can run the O scale layout at Nisme better than some of the better than uh, most, most of the members. That's way to my doctor. And, and, and he is a very good operator on the HO layout with the NCE DCC. That's great. That's excellent. We need new members, young members. That's good. That's good. So the only thing I'd want, I believe, uh, if an engineer wanted to, they could stop a train and whatever you know connect onto the telegraph to send messages so what if you have something like crewman sick or something or other we'd have the train stop have to connect onto the telegraph wires to send a message to a station no idea no idea yeah because uh, uh, carrying a tele telegrapher was not a standard procedure on on a lot of roads so like on the uh the WNA, they they picked up a a telegrapher during the chase uh, because the emergency. So what, he was there wasn't one on the train. Yeah. The engineer and conductor did not know telegraphy, so they had to pick up uh, some kid who was uh, a telegrapher. Right. Drop them off. Yeah. So DC, earlier you were uh, talking about um, the layout and interchanges, and uh, you were talking about how there were certain kinds of cars that were not uh, a, um, akin to the line that was pulling them. And I think uh, Walter was going to ask you a question about what what was that? What were you talking about then, DC? Um, kind of cars. I was looking at the records that Bernie had. Uh, copied from, you know, photographed from the uh, National Archives, and it actually showed all the rolling stock on the U.S. military railroads. And I was surprised at the number of rolling stock from foreign roads. Oh, right. And, right. and then what what the question was... Well, wait, 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 wait. I think, yeah, <laughs> Walter, what was your question? My question... Are, well, which country did those foreign railroads supply? Was it like from England or Canada or France? Like where? I never heard of such a thing back then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. I had to get that in. Yeah, okay, that was great. That was too good. Too good. And that was an honest question for those of you that weren't here earlier on. That was great. I, I've noticed that you didn't give the answer. For those who actually don't know what a foreign railroad is. A foreign railroad, let's say the U.S. military railroad, which did take over control of a lot of railroads. But I was surprised at the number of cars from the B&O Railroad and the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad, Orange and Alexandra. There were a number of different railroads cars that were being used on the U.S. military railroads. In the history of the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad, the president of the railroad is complaining about his cars being taken to foreign roads and Bar not brought roads. back. And what started it out is I built two cars and you know lettered them for the Philadelphia. Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad. I numbered one seven twenty because that's the number in John White's book on the development of the uh, railroad freight car. And turns out number seven twenty and seven nineteen, which is the other car I numbered, were actual cars used by the U.S. Military Railroad uh, during the war. So they're on my layout now. Well, there's several photographs on the ONA with Pennsylvania passenger cars, the very common pictures. So I'm I sure the US MRR picked up anything they could as quickly as they could because <laughs> they were in consistent need. But I would also think that they would uh, get uh, equipment that's uh, would be very close to whatever the gauge that was being used by the military railroad because uh, I would assume stuff like from the Erie 
would not be there because that's six foot gauge and you can't really move in the wheels that that deep. Yeah, in, in the list that, that Bernie supplied, it actually said, you know, five foot gauge or four foot, eight and a half inch gauge. So those were actually listed for the cars, what gauge they were in. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, you're absolutely right, Ed. Now, would they have, would they be able, did they have like four foot nine or four foot eight, or it had to be uh four foot uh, eight and a half? Which four I foot know eight? that the union line ran cars with wheels that had a rock wider tread so they could be used on different gauges, you know? So you could run them on four foot, eight and a half or five foot gauge simply because the the tread would be wider. So that even though my cars are going for, uh, you know, a semi-proto, you know, code 88 or whatever it is, uh, you know, using some of the older wheel sets is, is prototypical. <laughs> nice. Yeah, talking about uh, four foot nine inch gauge, the Pennsylvania Railroad was built a four foot nine inch gauge and stayed that way, I, I think into the 1880s. So there was there was that too. Actually, John, they, uh, they, they changed the gauge after the Civil War to four foot nine. It started out as standard gauge. Okay, yeah, okay. But uh, if they switched to four foot nine, and because of that, when the Southern Railroads did their big gauge change in the 1880s, they all switched to four foot nine. Mm. Because, uh, oh. Pennsylvania was the railroad that they did the most interchange with. How about that? Why, why did they okay. change the gauge, John? Uh, compromise. They, they wanted to uh, basically. Uh, do just exactly what you described. Uh, they right. wanted a wide wheel tread, and so they could run uh, four foot, ten inch gauge cars that they got out of Ohio. <laughs> it was all, all the railroads that they were acquiring in Ohio and going west to Chicago. Uh, a lot of them were four foot ten. So mm -hmm. again, it was a gauge compromise. Mm -hmm. uh, it was probably that, cheaper for them to. Uh... You know, labor is cheaper to move the rail that little bit than it is to uh, buy all new wheels. Yeah. Uh, there, there was apparently back then a difference of opinion on that. Everybody, <laughs> had, everybody had their own solution. Right, right. But all the USMLE stuff was standard gauge, four foot, eight and a half. And yeah, they did buy a lot of Pennsylvania equipment and B and O equipment and stuff that was really handy in the uh, you know the, uh, basically in the Philadelphia area that they could run down to Baltimore and then onto the occupied railroads. There was still the Susquehanna. See, I was surprised because there's still the Susquehanna River crossing. And I don't think they had the bridge. I don't think it was built yet. I think they still had the ferry cars across the river. Yep. So, so it surprised me that they would have Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore cars. Now, B&O cars did not surprise me a bit. But Now, they could run them across the Long Bridge from Washington, D.C. to Alexandria. Hmm. Well, all the five-foot gauge equipment that the USMLE bought that was all sent west, so they could run it on the Louisville and Nashville and all the Tennessee railroads heading down toward Atlanta. Yeah, the one of the interesting things is that the uh, the Albany and Schenectady Railroad, uh, which was the precursor to the New York Central, uh, that was also four foot nine. And uh, the thing is, talking about pontoons uh, got me uh, 
sort of like went off onto a tangent uh, la uh, pretty much last month of, you know, for floating bridges and stuff like that, because uh, uh, I wound up finding out that there's a floating bridge in Vermont, uh, I think about two miles north of me, I think, uh, which they actually wound up uh, restoring a bit, uh, recently. They actually turned around, took the bridge out, redesigned it and uh, made it, it's still a floating bridge. Uh, and I was surprised, you know, while searching for that bridge, all of a sudden it's like I find out there's other floating bridges that are still being used. Uh, there's one particular one that I was surprised to find out that a, it's a floating bridge, I think in the state of Washington, that's built to interstate standards. It's like a four, it's like a six lane highway that's floating. And I'm like going, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've actually been on that bridge. You beat me to it. I was going to mention that when you finished. Uh, it, it also has a light rail trackage across that floating bridge. And I'm yeah. trying, to, trying to figure out what town that was in or what city. Is it Seattle? Yeah, just outside Seattle, going across Lake Washington. Okay, you got it. Yep. Heading east. Mm -hmm. Now they have a couple of floating bridges up there. It's 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 I guess wherever there's no problem with tides raising and lowering the bridge. Mm. But it, it 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 always seems to be interesting when you think something that oh they don't you know they don't use this technology anymore and then you find out that no it's still being used. <laughs> Okay, gentlemen, I think uh, unless anyone has anything to ask, share, uh, we'll call it a wrap. And again, for those of you that were asking, I put it in the chat, Christopher Gable, C-SPAN video, Civil War Railroads. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, lecture to, to listen to. Uh, so with that, good to see you all. Have a great rest of your week, and I hope to see you uh, a couple weeks from now. Very good. Take care, right. gentlemen. Right. Good night. Good night.